Today I'm going to be talking about a topic that I've not yet seen covered in any depth or to any great degree. And that topic is the narrowing of the type of intelligence that tends to yield uh, benefits in our society. And I have talked on matters related, which is to say the general overall cognitive stratification that's been uh, afoot for at least 20 years, perhaps even longer. But I want to have a look at the trajectory of history here. So writing has been around for roughly 6,000 years. Uh, I may or may not uh, do a, a video on the history of writing. It, writing began as an accounting system. Uh, it moved beyond that uh, to a means of uh, communication, etc., etc. But for a very, very long time, uh, writing, despite its uh, prominence throughout uh, the civilized world, relatively speaking, of course, reading and writing, were the tools and property, as it were, of the wealthy, the capable, and or, etc. And it was a premium good. Men who were literate, the literati, were men who were in control of things. And this was not just unique to the West. Uh, for example, um, when King Sejong in 1446 approximately, in what is now known as uh, Korea, uh, promoted the idea of an alphabet, the Hangul alphabet, to replace what had traditionally been the means of communication, written communication in Korean hanja or uh, Chinese characters, it was met with a lot of hostility for a number of reasons in this case. The uh, men of learning, the learned, uh, had spent, in some cases, decades studying Chinese characters to get where they were, but also the concern being that the general flow of information uh, might be controlled. And so... In many ways, uh, reading and writing were the province of the powerful, and the powerful sought to keep it uh, that case for as long as possible, whether it was in the Far East or in the West. People who could read and write were a distinct advantage, uh, and along with that came basic numeracy, of course. You did have a general thrust in education in terms of the so-called middle age uh, curricula, sometimes called the quadrivium and the trivium, uh, respectively. The quadrivium uh, consisting of arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy, and the trivium consisting of grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And we can see wedged in there, of course, uh, in the trivium, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, not exclusively, but very much focused on language and letters. Now, something happened along the way that changed the game dramatically uh, when it came to reading and writing and accessibility. Uh, for the longest time, particularly in the West, uh, if you wanted to produce a written document, uh, velum was required, which is a type of um, animal skin. It was written upon, uh, sometimes it was from swine, other times from deer, etc. It didn't really matter, different types of velum. And all of this needed to be uh, done by hand, much room for error, etc., etc. Nonetheless, a lot of skill and time and effort uh, was required to do these things. And along comes somebody in the 15th century, many of you might know him. In English, we call him Gutenberg, Johannes Gutenberg. Uh, Johannes Gutenberg, his full name, he was born into... Uh, the upper classes is Johannes Gensfleisch zur Laden zum Gutenberg. And he is uh, quite well known as the man who revolutionized uh, books, put simply. He created the printing press in the mid 15th century. In 1439, uh, that is the traditional date, he manages to pull off what had never been seen before in Europe, uh, a mechanical printing press that allowed for the mass production of books, in particular the Bible, the so-called 
Gutenberg Bible is one of the most famous uh, works to result from this, but the printing press changed everything on a number of levels. For one, access to reading and writing became something that more people uh, could gain just by dint of the fact that there was a, a means of mass production in terms of written literature, uh, although for the most part that was the Bible at this stage. And beyond that, for centuries there had been a lot of pushback against the use of Latin as the sole means of communication and scholarship in specifically writing but also in speech. That is to say that there had been a series of movements by the intelligentsia. Uh, I think the place where this is best described or best exemplified would be in Italy. There's this tradition of the so-called three Italian crowns, uh, Petrarch, Boccaccio, and Dante, all pushing for a vernacular literature in the uh, 14th century. And this built a lot of momentum up with regards to the vernacular. Vernacular refers to the speech of the people the vulgar language, as it were. And so you have printing, you have this, and reading and writing becomes something of a more dangerous uh, quantity because it's more accessible, in theory at least, although, of course, it's not nearly as accessible as it would be in later centuries, and more and more people are, of course, acquiring these skills. But it's still more or less the domain of a certain intelligentsia a certain class of people. And I would argue, despite these developments, there is a degree of continuity from the earliest emergence of writing as a tool of communication, a tool of scholarship, a tool of literature, and the time of Gutenberg, as well as onwards well into the 20th century. And I would, in my own little classification, call this period of time, which spans, incidentally, millennia, the age of letters. It's when reading and writing really are the skills that give you special powers, uh, so to speak access to things nobody else has access to. Uh, you can forge documents. You can read books. You can compose books. You're part of an elite class. And the printing press itself doesn't really change this. It makes this age of letters, uh, if anything, more potent. There are more people producing literary works. It can be mass-produced. And uh, more and more people get access to it all. But something eventually changes. We begin to shift from an age of letters to an age of numbers, hence the title of the video. Of course, the title was a bit deceptive. One could think that I am referring to uh, the age of numbers in the YouTube sense, you know, how many clicks you get and how many views and what have you, and that's, of course, very important. But no. What's very interesting, and I think what happened roughly in the middle of the 20th century and, and rapidly accelerated towards the end of the 20th century and we are knee deep in it right now is that we transition from this period of continuity, this age of letters that spanned millennia albeit with different forms from you know, writing on uh, parchment, uh, papyrus to, to velum uh, to actual books that contain pages with uh, printed block letters, etc. Nonetheless, this period of continuity, age of letters, to the current year, the age of numbers. Now, what do I mean by this? I mean that literacy in general has, over time, become a very cheap good, indeed. Uh, everyone, more or less, in industrialized, developed countries has access to it. It's nothing special. And with the ascendance of machines, then you could argue that World War II could not have been won without an understanding of machines and uh, numbers. Numeracy of a sort that goes far beyond the type of numeracy that I cited, say in the Quadrivium, Arithmetic, Geometry, Music, and Astronomy. Numeracy 
has become ascendant. It's a very uh, narrow bandwidth of, of intelligence, one could say. It started roughly in the mid-20th century um, after World War II, and it has gained rapidly in terms of how important it is to be numerically fit. And we've seen a decrease in interest in terms of uh, people's ability to compose, to read, etc. Now, one thing that you can see immediately in today's day and age uh, in terms of communication is the notion of, of text messages, abbreviations, uh, emojis, everything and anything to get around what might be considered unwieldy long forms of communication. Better just get the message out. If you scour YouTube for videos uh, on historical topics, you'll see people not understanding how to properly title their videos. You'll have things such as, what if the Byzantines did not do X, rather than what if the Byzantines had not done X. That is the uh, proper use of a historical conditional. That's just one minor example. Overall grammatical knowledge has slipped. People are writing less and less. And people's interest in being able to express themselves adequately, and certainly <laughs> eloquently, has waned as well. It's always get to the point. It's always uh, expressing yourself as pithily as possible, uh, and not just pithily, but in as an accessible way as possible. Uh, there is a frowning upon uh, what people formerly referred to as grandiloquence, although the definition of what the common man might deem grandiloquence these days is uh, probably pretty variable. Uh, people just don't have access to the same type of vocabulary they used to, um, and a lot of that is related to the decrease uh, in, in reading comprehension, decrease in reading uh, in general. Another thing that's happened in this transition from the age of letters to the age of numbers is the type of reading we engage in. These days, the current year, we tend to engage in reading for information much more than we do reading for pleasure. Pleasure reading, increasingly, seems to be relegated to listening to things. And indeed, even reading for information uh, has become that many times. You can look at the internet, and you can look at the comments. And I've had conversations with many people on this matter, and you can see that the overall thrust is going towards audiobooks. But to get back to the prior point, when you're reading for information, you tend to be very focused. And so the type of pleasure you might gain from leisurely reading uh, dissipates. And it's much easier to just have an audiobook running on the background, whether you're taking a walk. All of this is understandable. But if we as people read less and less, if we write less and less, the quality of these things is naturally going to suffer. Now, fortunately, or unfortunately, because we've more or less transitioned to this age of numbers as opposed to an age of letters, where primary importance is attached to a certain type of numeracy, it doesn't really much matter that people can no longer express themselves well or that their vocabularies have greatly dwindled. Uh, in a world of emojis and text chat, that matters very little. What matters is a type of skill set that can lead you to become an efficient software developer, a uh, quantum fund manager, etc., etc. None of these professions that tend to yield uh, great remunerative results demand any type of verbal acuity on the part of the people involved. And so one thing that we've seen is this huge transition, and I'd argue maybe one of the greatest transitions in intellectual life from Men of letters to men of numbers. The man of letters has been, well, left by the wayside by the dust of history. 
there's no value assigned to the man of letters and what he has done and did. Uh, and that is a break from a continuity that has existed, as I said at the outset, uh, since the inception of writing itself, more or less, and the ability to communicate and tell tales and write literature. Uh, everyone can read and write, but the quality of that reading and writing has gone down tremendously. And in its place uh, has arisen a narrow bandwidth of intelligence that specializes in things like the ability to write code. And of course, in addition to the ability to write code, uh, you need to have patience, obviously. But patience was something that uh, people in the Middle Ages needed to, to produce books and literature. It took a long time. Um, the ability to see uh, patterns. Basically, raw mathematical ability is far more important these days than it ever had been in previous times. And most importantly, it is raw mathematical ability that uh, tends to yield the best results in terms of remuneration, getting the money that you need as an individual. And I've talked about, of course, in the past, cognitive stratification. It's one of my major concerns going forward in the future, whether I'm alive or not, to witness the full scale of this cognitive stratification. But it isn't just people who had never been part of the intelligentsia who are going to be left behind. It is the people who were formerly uh, teachers of grammar, uh, historians, etc., etc. Uh, they may or may not find their niche somehow, assuming they have the requisite skills. But people whose so you could say bandwidth of intelligence is more focused on the verbal. Well, they are uh, shit out of luck, I would say, long term. And the entire cultural shift that has accompanied this has been quite fascinating to witness, in addition to all the you know, short text messages, the emojis, etc. There's a general disdain for any type of measured prescriptive thought regarding language. Everyone has a voice. Everyone has the ability to communicate, and it's all equally valid. This has been a huge shift from previous times when you had class distinction, the aspiration to be, to be able to uh, speak, read, and write in a better, more eloquent manner. That's all gone. Nobody cares about that anymore. And so numeracy, the age of numbers, is the name of the game. Silicon Valley, uh, coding, programming, software development. Now, of course, not all of this is directly related to mathematics, but generally speaking, it is a mathematical mind that tends to dominate these fields. And this is uh, concerning on a number of fronts, uh, just because cognitive stratification is taking place, but it's taking place uh, to a degree that even greater numbers of people will be excluded from participating in the work world than if we were to just talk about cognitive stratification. When you have machines or AI being able to do mundane tasks of secretarial work, for example, general reading and writing things that people just can't be bothered with, these types of jobs will go out the window. With increasingly diminished importance ascribed to the verbal, I could easily see less stress put on these subjects in schools, and indeed, we have seen this. It used to be that studying, say, Latin in a Western high school was a pretty normal thing, and you can still find it in certain religious schools, Catholic uh, high schools, and what have you. But it's become increasingly rare. Foreign languages in the United States, increasingly rare, not necessarily obligatory, etc., etc. So this trend has been there for quite some time. But now the ascendancy of machines and, and numeracy of a specific kind is the name of the game. And so when we worry about cognitive stratification, it is doubly worrying because whole swaths of people who otherwise might not be dumb but are not born programmers or coders and cannot manage quantum hedge funds, uh, they will be left behind, although they might have been very good rhetoric teachers or they might have been um, good authors or they might have been simply good teachers of reading and writing, which in former times 
uh, was a useful skill to communicate and impart to young people. No longer. And I try to look at this development uh, through neutral lens, uh, although it does sadden me a bit. Uh, it probably was an inevitability once machines really started taking hold in our in our lives. And so clear communication is no longer that important. And indeed, the more obscure and obfuscatory a message is, these days, at least on the internet, it seems the more valuable uh, it can be. Uh, confusion, or sowing the seeds of confusion, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the internet and things that are typed and published seems as important as putting out uh, clear, forthright messages. So I think going forward, we should all have our eyes wide open and looking towards this type of development becoming ever starker in contrast to uh, former trends. That is the great transition from the age of letters to the current year, the age of numbers that we live in. And with that said, I think I've said my piece on the matter. There is, of course, a lot more to say on reading and writing. It's a subject I've always found interesting, and I may or may not do an actual video on its history in great, much greater depth, of course. Um, but that is a tale for another time. And as always, if I'm still alive, I will check you out later. Enjoy the rest of your week. Bye-bye, and may the gods watch over you. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.